Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. These are the words of Paul in Philippians chapter 4, verses 8. Brethren, a blessed good morning to you. My hope for you is that through all what is laid out before you, that peace, love, and harmony surround you and your loved ones as we embark on another new day and week ahead of us. May you have a safe, productive, and fruitful week. As we continue our journey with Luke in Acts 24, we will hear the narration of Paul's trial before Governor Felix in Caesarea Maritima. Paul returned to Jerusalem after his third missionary journey to accusations. He taught Jewish Christians they did not have to circumcise their sons. Acts 21, 20 to 21. Paul's defense before Felix and that he was held in custody. Now, let's turn our attention to the dramatization of Acts chapter 24, verse 1 to 27. Here begins the reading. Five days later, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and an attorney, a certain Tertullus, and they reported their case against Paul to the governor. When Paul had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Your Excellency, because of you we have long enjoyed peace, and reforms have been made for these people because of your foresight. We welcome this in every way and everywhere with utmost gratitude. But, to detain you no further, I beg you to hear us briefly with your customary graciousness. We have, in fact, found this man a pestilent fellow, an agitator among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, and so we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn from him concerning everything of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the charge by asserting that all this was true. When the governor motioned to him to speak, Paul replied, I cheerfully make my defense, knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation. As you can find out, it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. They did not find me disputing with anyone in the temple or stirring up a crowd, either in the synagogues or throughout the city. Neither can they prove to you the charge that they now bring against me. But this I admit to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our ancestors, believing everything laid down according to the law or written in the prophets. I have a hope in God, a hope that they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. Therefore, I do my best always to have a clear conscience toward God and all people. Now, after some years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to offer sacrifices. 
while I was doing this, they found me in the temple, completing the rite of purification without any crowd or disturbance. But there were some Jews from Asia. They ought to be here before you to make an accusation. If they have anything against me, or let these men here tell what crime they had found when I stood before the council. Unless it was this one sentence that I called out while standing before them. It is about the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. But Felix, who was rather well informed about the way, adjourned the meeting with the comment, When Lysias the Tribune comes down, I will decide your case. Then he ordered the centurion to keep him in custody, but to let him have some liberty and not to prevent any of his friends from taking care of his needs. Some days later, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him speak concerning faith in Christ Jesus. And as he discussed justice, self-control, and the coming judgment, Felix became frightened and said, Go away for the present. When I have an opportunity, I will send for you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul, and for that reason, he used to send for him very often and converse with him. After two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, and since he wanted to grant the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Here ends the reading of the Epistle of Acts, chapter 24. Praise be to Christ our Lord. I am your host, Agnes Aventurin, bringing the meditation to you this morning. I trust that as I speak, God will let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to him. He is my rock and redeemer. I therefore place my trust in you, Lord. Amen. My meditation for today is entitled The Life of Integrity. The Oxford Dictionary defines integrity as the quality of being and having strong moral principles. A gentleman of complete integrity. We are faced with this word every day. It might be used in other perspectives as honesty, sincerity, and frankness. These words are attributes displayed in every one of us especially children of God, which don't always manifest in us. I encourage you to peruse chapter 24 from verse 1 to 21, which was read earlier. Talking about character and living it are two different things. When we find a man whose life radiates integrity, we should pause and learn from him. The Apostle Paul was such a man. In his defense before Felix to the charges that the Jewish leaders brought against him, Paul proclaimed his integrity by saying, I also do my best to maintain always a blameless conscience, both before God and before men, in verse 16. But he not only proclaimed his integrity, he lived it. The proof of Paul's integrity is the great impact he has had on so many down through the centuries. I admired Paul since a young age and always prayed to God to instill some of Paul's character in me. I was in awe of his strength and boldness. He never compromised 
and stood up for what he believed. He was blunt and did not sugarcoat matters to keep friendship. In the council, Paul defended himself for all accusations made on him point by point, which enabled him to present the gospel message through his defense. Paul's accusers were unable to present specific evidence to support their general accusations. For example, in verse 18 and 19, Paul was accused of starting trouble among the Jews in the province of Asia. But the Jews in the province of Asia were not present to confirm the matter. In verse 14 to 24, he used every opportunity to witness for Christ. Paul's talk with Felix became so personal that Felix grew fearful. Felix, like Herod Antipas, each had something in common. They had taken another man's wife. To support this, see Mark 6, verse 17 and 18. Paul's words were interesting to him until they focused on righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. Many people will be glad to discuss the gospel with us as long as it doesn't touch their lives too personally. When it does, some will resist or run. But this is what the gospel is all about, God's power to change lives. The New International Version Study Bible declares that the gospel is not effective until it moves from principles and doctrine into life-changing dynamic. When someone resists or runs from your witness, you have undoubtedly succeeded in making the gospel personal. As you see, Paul wasn't a liar. He told the truth and remained steadfast to God. Christian friends, we can follow and use opportunities to witness to people like the example shown by Paul. Sister Arlene spoke about this a few weeks ago. Remember? She said we should be ready to use the opportunity to share the gospel of Christ with everyone we meet outside of the church. I encourage you to read or listen to chapter 24, verse 1 to 9, concerning Tertullus and what accusations he presented to Felix against Paul to have him assassinated. And so here is a man of integrity up against a lawyer, a group of Jewish leaders who had tried to assassinate him, and a governor who definitely lacked integrity. In this case, Paul teaches us that we can live with integrity by speaking the truth, by living in line with scripture, and by keeping a blameless conscience before God and men. Another lesson that is evident from our text, a life of integrity does not shield us from being falsely accused. We are naive if we think that we live with integrity. We will be protected from false accusations and slanderous attempts to bring us down. If this world were made up of basically good people, a man of integrity would be well loved and have no enemies. But since this world is made up of sinners who love darkness rather than light, and since a life of integrity exposes their evil deeds, sinners will often slander the man of integrity. The role acted out here between Felix and Tortilius against Paul is very visible in today's world. So this pattern is nothing new to us. As we follow the news every day, we are confronted with the same of behavior, both locally and internationally. We are faced with lower standards in high places. 
persons in authority using their powers to bring down others. They become greedy and selfish. They plot against each other for their own gains, be it for position or financial reasons. They do it with no sympathy. And the blame game and schemes continue in many other forms. At times, person get punished for things they didn't do. Similarly, this happens to Christians as well. We are not exempted from this role. Persons holding positions sometimes compromises with others because of their status or the relationship he or she might have with a member. This is not the way we should live, brothers and sisters in Christ. God chose Paul and turned him around to do good with that same passion he had before he was converted from Saul to Paul. In Acts chapter 22, verse 19, when God called Paul to witness for him, he reluctantly testified to God that the people themselves knew that in every synagogue he imprisoned and beat those who believed in him. In verse 20, he continued, and while the blood of his witness, Stephen, was shed, he himself was standing by, approving and keeping the courts of those who killed Stephen. God knew what he was testifying to was true. However, he said to him in verse 21, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Was God ever disappointed in his decision? No, definitely not. Lastly, we can live with integrity by keeping a blameless conscience before God and men. In light of Paul's hope in God and in light of the certainty of the resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked, Paul sought to maintain always a blameless conscience before God and before men. The concept of maintaining a good conscience is an important one. In scripture, Paul later tells Timothy, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. 1 Timothy 1.5 He tells Timothy, to keep faith and a good conscience, warning him that some have rejected these qualities and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. In verse 19, you can find that in verse 19. So it is crucial for us to understand what it means to maintain a good conscience and to practice it daily. Amen. Listeners, if you are blessed by this program, I encourage you to share it with your friends so they too will experience the same. You can also follow us on the Methodist Church St. Martin Circuit Facebook or on YouTube.